Hey everybody, today is January 11th, 2022. This is the KCP community meeting. Uh, we don't really have much on, an, on the agenda today, although I do see that Steve just added something. So let me screen share this, bear with me just a second here. Okay, get this out of the way. Okay, so the first item on the agenda is Steve with update on single integer resource version for workspace scoped client interactions. Um, before Steve gets started, let me just paste the link to this particular page in the chat. So if you do have an agenda item, please feel free to add a comment and we will see if we have time to get to it. Hopefully we will. So Steve, over to you. Cool, thanks. Um, so the background for this topic is uh, when you're uh, talking to KCP and you're talking across multiple workspaces, uh, we end up needing to have a more complicated resource version to uh, hold the state about which specific workspaces you're talking to. Um, but something that we were trying to uh, keep is a single integer resource version when you're just talking to one workspace by itself that way that you know nothing changes for existing clients that are expecting one cube cluster. Uh, and we think it's mostly possible. Um, the, one, uh, the one thing that we found we're probably not going to be able to do is uh, make sure that you can compare the resource version between two different objects. Uh, so if I have a, a config map, for instance, and I know that it's at resource version 10, I can't say anything about a secret that I have that's at resource version 100. So after rereading the code in cube uh, yesterday that parses resource version, I don't think there's any in cube controllers that are doing that particular type of comparison. Um, but I'm hoping that uh, this maybe jogs people's memory or, or they think about places where they're using and parsing resource version. So if there's examples of, of people doing that, uh, I'd be Keen to, keen, to, keen to know. So it's not about events, right? Events can be compared, but objects uh, cannot. Like, where do we have this causality property? Uh, so yes, if you're if you're somehow keeping a clock and watching events or you have watch events coming in, like those are those continue to be in the right order. Um, but if you're just looking at the resource versions on the objects in the watch events, then you can't say anything. I assume you could, within a single resource, like look at two resource versions for it. And if they're, if they're different, that still means that it's been updated, right? Yeah, so uh, yes. the equality comparison always continues to work. Um, and in the scheme that we've figured out, we can also have comparisons of resource versions for a given object. So I know that this version is newer or older than this other version. It's across objects that that um, breaks down. So you cannot say that A is older than B because the resource version is like that. And for the intuition, we have storage migration for CRDs, for example, which randomly shuffles order. So even in cube, we don't have that. Yeah, I, uh, what Stefan is getting at is there's a couple things in cube today that mean that if you're if you're trying to rely on this comparison between objects, you're probably subtly broken. Storage migration was one. Um, Encryption key it's, rotation was another. Yeah. And in general, every user can annotate, for example, at any point in time yeah. and change order. So we, th we think it's probably safe, but we'd love to hear if anyone has any thoughts on it or any examples. That's all we Makes got. Makes sense. Thanks, Steve. Uh, do you want to post this anywhere for broader Yes. Uh, consumption and feedback and visibility. Yeah. Uh, today, I'm going to try to write up the actual scheme that we're <laughs> thinking of using, and then um, uh, something that for uh, Seagate PM machinery. OK, thanks. 
So I think we can move on to the next item, which is Paul and Next Milestone brainstorming. Paul. Yeah, so quick little background on that. Uh, Stefan was nice enough to set us up a, a project within GitHub where we've kind of aggregated uh, the items that we came up with in the work packages document into a milestone. I don't think it's it's documented anywhere other than a, a Slack thread at this point, but the hope was this would be uh, achieved by the end of January. So my question for the group was, do we want to take that same approach to define what the next refinement of that story is? As in, work it in the work packages document, change the story, pull in some of the midterm goals, and then move it into another milestone? Or is there another approach people would like to do? Or are we off track? I'm happy to do brainstorming for ideas for the milestone wherever. The Google Doc is fine, but I think just like we did with the um, current milestone, <clears throat> putting things in GitHub is the best end place. I would like to see a story like what we had with Prototype 2, where we describe what we present basically in this format, like a demo we would run on the Prototype 3, if it's if this is a name. And then we identify the minimal viable features, basically, from that. I know Bob had a want to do... spreadsheet somewhere with the different uh, milestones. That might be a good basis, yes. We could start there. I'm not sure if it's still accurate. OK, cool. Well, if folks like that approach, then I'll, I'll just throw a section in here where we can do that story refinement. And I'll send a, just a, a reminder out to the Slack channel on that. And we can uh, discuss it in the next meeting or, or see where we stand based on the conversation that happens in the document. That works for me. So a thumbs up from Steve. So uh, if there's no more comments on milestone planning, we can move on to what Stefan volunteered me for, which is an update on trying to uh, make listers and controllers and clients work uh, both upstream uh, and downstream uh, in a Kubernetes environment or a KCP environment with logical clusters. I still don't have a demo to show because I'm in the middle of some code changes, but I can provide an update. So if you were here last week, uh, you may remember that I was adding methods to listers where if it originally had a list method, there was now a list with context method that took in a context and the same thing with get. And it was sort of magically able to determine which logical cluster to go look in based on some setup that the, the developer would do to make all of that transparent. Um, that ended up not being super tenable because I ended up confusing myself with when to call list or list with context based on what I was trying to do. So I took a new approach. And let me switch to my editor here. Give me just a minute to get the right. Um, Right code up. Uh, we'll go with the. So let me share VS Code and make the font bigger so you all can see it. All right. So this is um, some code for a controller in the API extensions API server in Kubernetes. This particular controller handles CRDs and whether or not their names uh, collide or they're available, among other things. And so one thing that I needed to do here was similar to last time, I need to be able to list all CRDs but not truly be all CRDs because we don't want to go across every single logical cluster. Um, in logical cluster A and logical cluster B, it's totally fine if each one declares a CRD named foo and they can be different and independent from each other with different schemas and, and they, they are truly independent. And so in order to do that, I need to be able to uh, do a list call against the lister but only see the uh, logical cluster that we are looking at. So what I had before is this code that's commented out around 
decoding a key and then creating a sync context. Um, so I've done something a little bit different, but the idea is the same. There is a, a developer supplied function called scope from key. And the idea with a scope here is that it's meant to subdivide a space into scopes or portions. And so here, uh, the key for a normal Kubernetes environment would just be the, the name of the custom resource definition. So, you know, this could be uh, clusters.xcates.io. And, um, or sorry, clusters.cluster.xcates.io. Um, so in a KCP enabled environment, this key is actually going to have whatever the logical cluster name is. So this could be my logical cluster. And then um, the convention that I have for right now is it's just divided with a dollar sign. So the first part is the logical cluster name and the second part is the key name. So um, <laughs> uh, thanks Steve about the uh, mutation cache being a headache. So this uh, particular function will create a scope where the scope has, oh my code completion is not working or jumping is not working. The scope has a name method. Scope is an interface and the name in this case will be my logical cluster. So um, this code below is a little bit different from what we had before. The mutation cache, there now needs to be one per scope. And then I create a scoped instance of the controller, passing in the scope, passing in a scoped lister, or sorry, scoped client, scoped lister, the specific mutation cache in this case for the scope. And then I call sync on this new scoped controller. And what you'll see when I get to the sync function, which is here, is that um, it can call get on the key. And oh, I might not have done this right, but it would be able to, to call get on the key and it would function just fine. The, um, this would be a scoped get based on the logical cluster. And then any um, any actions that do things like update status, this would be scoped as well. So it would go against the correct logical cluster and not against the, a default or an empty logical cluster. And this will work for namespace things as well. So there is a, like in the, um, I'm in the wrong. I have the wrong one shared. That's why my stuff's not working. Give me just a second to switch my share. OK, so um, just to show some more changes, I was working on the clients. And I was playing around with deployments in particular for the deployment splitter. And so there's now this new scoped deployments method on the client set. And what this will give you is a deployment scoper that can then give you deployments for a namespace. So um, what I have been working on here, get rid of those, is... Second to find oh, this is not in here. Well, I was working on the uh, the namespace controller and the namespace resources deleter, which needs scoped metadata clients and uh, scoped lister or yeah, scoped lister. So all of this together, hopefully, will make things a lot easier. So that even um, if you're doing something like custom resource discovery and you're just trying to serve up HTTP you can say, I need the scope from the context. This comes from the request. And you get a lister that's scoped. And then you can just list everything. Or you can do a get. And things just work. And I haven't quite 
worked out the best place to set the um, the scope. But for right now, in KCP's handler, which looks at the path and figures out which logical cluster is the client requesting, it will create a scope, indicate if it's wildcard or not. Uh, it'll set the, the scope on the context. And there's also a storage scope that I've been working on. This might not be the best place to set it. But with these, uh, with these two scopes set, the API server is able to do things appropriately whenever you're using a client. The um, listers will work if you need them to be scoped. And there's a couple places in etcd storage where we need to be able to adjust prefixes based on the logical cluster name. So uh, I'm just marking the, uh, the code base. What's this? Could you could you show what the what the scope struct looks like? Yes. Now now that I have autocomplete, I can. <laughs> or uh, so the these methods may change names. They may get split up. They may be in the wrong package, but. Uh, the scope's name is me basically meant to be the logical cluster. There are some places where I need to take a key that doesn't include the logical cluster name in it and include and attach it so that it works for pulling out of an index or out of the cache. That's what this cache key function does. Um, and I can show where it's used. So the naming controller, for example, um, when it so it has a CRD and so it's syncing a particular CRD and it says, oh, I couldn't find that CRD. Let me go requeue all the other CRDs in this group. And so it goes through and it lists all of the CRDs. And as long as it's a different name, then it needs to add it to the queue. It can't just add the name of the CRD because the name of the CRD is going to be, again, you know, foos.example.com. And this actually needs to enqueue the cluster and then foos.example.com. And so you have to call this here. I, I'm trying eventually to get to a point where it's very easy to know if you do or don't have to call a method like this. But for right now, um, you have to be aware if you're trying to work in a multi-scope environment or not. So th this is kind of a, it's an exceptional thing. I wouldn't expect most single cluster targets to need to do anything with this. It's more like operators that are trying to provide a service with APIs that cross all logical clusters in a shard. And so you would want to do this if you're manually, um, Needing there's to some a cache key name. You know, one of the things that jumped out at me, Andy, was like there's a, a couple of analogs here to like sharding, uh, breaking up a problem. Like uh, we've already talked about how controllers pointing at a set of workspaces might actually want to have a break point uh, between them um, on some characteristic of the workspaces for various reasons, regional, geographic, um, pure performance based. So I could see there being elements of key separation. Um, sometimes it's secondary attributes. Um, so maybe the interface, this pattern doesn't quite work well for those. But then I was also kind of, as you're pointing out with namespace, like there are places where I could imagine controllers that are looking at a subset of like scheduler and nodes do this pretty aggressively where they look at field selectors on a cache and they're using the indexer or they're passing a field selector through. There's some parallels there that this at least points in that direction. I don't have any like concrete suggestions right now, but it's at least worth worth thinking through or looking at some of those other use cases as we go a little bit further and seeing whether even some of those might map like um, constructing a cache with a field selector on node for controllers that break things down by node is any of the, the scope caching relevant there um, and the parallels to indexer where you might actually want an indexer and then pair a scope with an aspect of yeah, the indexer. And that they are heavily paired right now. So when um, when you do uh, like in a lister, if you look at a deployment lister, for example, and you're trying to list all deployments, maybe 
you know, ignore a selector, say it's everything. You're trying to list all deployments. In if you point the deployment lister at a cache from a shared informer that's doing a cross cluster list watch, which it usually you'd want to do, then this is going to return everything across all logical clusters. And so if you have a scoped lister, then it basically says, I need to go and um, actually, let me, I was in the wrong one. If you have a scoped lister and you're trying to list all deployments, we're going to go grab an index value based on the scope's name. Like this is kind of magic under the covers right now. And it's going to go against a specifically named index and use that value. If you have a namespace lister, then it's going to assume by default that there's no scoping and there's no manipulation of the key needed. And so that'll be the value that goes against the namespace index. But if it is scoped, again, this is you know the magic connection, brittle, uh, the brittle connection here is it's going to call cache key, which is going to put that logical cluster name in. Uh, Stefan and I were talking about the idea of, well, maybe we could take scopes and sort of pair them with an index and make them hierarchical. So you could have like one scope, which is at the logical cluster level, and then a nested or a child scope that's at the namespace level. And how, I, but the order matters and how do we get the yeah. constructed correctly? So it's a little challenging. The order matters, but it, or, it matters in the same way that everything we do in it's in cube is based around the access patterns we have against etcd and a fundamental like idea of we just have a set of prefixes on a key space so it's and, and again a cluster scope is a key space prefix something like a pod to note isn't but in an index you're always talking about prefixes like there's only certain there's only so many ways you can build an index it's either a, a range map or a a hash table and you either need ranging or you don't and we need ranging so the number of algorithm algorithmic data structures that support that just happens to be pretty limited so it isn't a bad assumption um like the the, the parallels between key construction nested scoping and then indexing which is creating a key with nested scoping and then secondary indexes, which are basically an attempt to pivot on something that's not the primary key. Like, so there's a lot of analogs here too. We just need to figure out what the, the most convincing argument is that this is something that actually fixes like, like safety, right? Like some of the things you mentioned, like places where we put keys into caches is somewhat unsafe today. I'm not advocating that would go down generics this fast in cube, although I don't know what, we haven't talked about it. Jordan and I were like at least having some basic discussions about like maybe we wait a couple of releases before we push too hard on that. But like there are places where how we put the safety around what goes into caches, the safety around what comes out of the storage layer, we are missing opportunities to be safer. And we do occasionally have bugs in controllers due to bad key construction or error. Like on an error case, someone puts stuff back in the queue in the wrong key. So there's at least some some elements I could see us getting down that point. Um, and maybe even at the end of the day, it's just about what's a minimum carry for at least the next six months or nine months. Like what's a minimum carry that conceptually gives us the expertise to say, oh, but this has a benefit. So that might even be enough. Yeah. But it looks good. Um, and then one, oh, I was going to show you the storage scope too. So there's some places where, um, we we may need to change the key root depending on if it's a wildcard um, list watch or not. And then, uh, so these two to go go together. The from prefix and key basically undoes or takes into account wildcarding. And then uh, one thing that I did, we had some code that um, if like anytime we're doing a list or a get and or a watch and we've got objects coming back there was code in decode and append list item that was setting the cluster name on the object metadata and i've moved that into the scope so if there is a scope that is available for uh, the flow then it'll just call post decode and what that does 
uh, it is the same logic that was and over there. I was, um, you know, in thinking about like option two, um, you know, like a little bit of my thinking has been the actual model that you'd use to store this in SQL versus pure key value, like ultimately the table that holds, you need to make a table that holds objects. And I was kind of debating in my head between a column that has the key and a column and three columns or four columns, resource, cluster, namespace, whatever. Um, because ultimately some of the, like your, whatever storage we would pick from a database side, we're still basically just mapping onto a sorted lexicographic key space. Um, you know, the way that like Cockroach or even Postgres models, tuples and all that, like you're still at the end of the day getting to some sequence of bytes that is a prefix, prefix scannable for the primary key. So there was kind of some questions about like, if we broke the columns up in SQL, in a SQL type approach for the backend storage, which might live side by side, like I'm starting to think that there might actually be benefits to both having an etcd storage and a SQL storage equally. But if you broke those apart, you had those attributes that simplifies a lot of the data modeling and potentially it gives you opportunities to go and say like, instead of referencing resources by uh, the resource type by a name, you'd reference it by a UID, which gives you other properties um, like better foreign key integrity. And so there's some open questions about, because there's no name, uh, we don't care about uh, prefix scanning on the resource name itself. Um, like we don't do anything in the keys in etcd to organize them by group, then by kind, then by, um, you know, like where any kind of prefix would ever be relevant. So it was kind of one of those questions about what would be the changes to the storage layer to do that? And some of that was places where we pass around strings to build cache keys, would we pass around a tuple, which is very similar to the rest scope stuff, which is, and what we go in cache keys is like string is the, uh, we all talked about this, like string is the most efficient mechanism because it plays well with like, you put it into the string and then everything in the go path is, is simple. If you switch to like a struct with a set of variable options, you're still doing dereferences. So like there's some efficiency gains losses, but it, I was kind of going through this in my head, Andy, and, and I'm seeing similarities here, which is we've gotten away in cube for encoding an optional scope, the namespace, and a required scope, the resource, for a very long time. There are some aspects of it that if there may be overlap where we'd be like, you know what, that, that abstraction is just not so fundamental that you couldn't go do a switch and 99.9% .9 of users wouldn't even notice the difference, but it would give us some clarity and, and efficiency stuff, like places where you know, it might it might be a good exercise just to see if anybody breaks as you look through the refactor. So I was kind of playing through my head like, all keys being switched to some form of, you know, opaque tuple, um, you know, key prefix tuple. And yeah, I mean, right imply. now they're, they're still strings. And I, I have a way to get the key converted to an interface, which then exposes namespace and name methods. Which, so. which means you're paying the cost, like you're actually, like, because of that, you've got an interface object in the map. So you're already paying in indirection. So you're doing one more pointer access. So it's kind of one of those, like, if we're going to go to that level, then the string doesn't really add much anymore if you've got to go to the interface. And I was trying to think through ways of like cheaply skipping that. And some of it might be a, um, uh, a slice might actually be relevant, um, but we need to think about like, we need to think about what the typing looks like and whether we even care about the efficiency of this. Like this is a pretty fundamental efficiency thing for caches. So, but we could certainly tolerate some efficiency losses in caches if it gave us better type safety or better um, checks when people scrub errors. Like the fact that we drop strings into um, work queues uh, is still kind of problematic. Like work queues are a place where if we were going to go do generics, I would probably do generics over work queues mm -hmm. um, or have someone speculatively look at that. Um, and the moment you do that, you're starting to get into a spot of like, would you want that same type safety elsewhere? And the answer is probably storage interface, cache interface, et cetera. So um, it would be good maybe, Andy, if you could look at some, I don't know if this is easy, but like maybe do some apples to apples with your change to the cache and just get a ballpark for like, say you put, 10,000 or a million keys in a cache and look at how some of the common list operations look before and after your change, whether there's anything noticeable just to like, 
just to ask the question, do we change overall characteristics? Um, might be something just to, if you can get a quick experiment going. Yep, yep, I took a note of that, thanks. All right, I saw Steve, you had a couple questions. Um, one, is this more invasive and would this be easier to, an easier fork to keep or whatnot? Um, I, I mean, I, I still wanna get all of this upstream if possible. So I wouldn't expect that this would be a fork we would maintain long time for a long time unless we just fail at <laughs> convincing the SIGs to take it upstream. So yes, it's it's more invasive than the context methods, but uh, if you had been sitting with me when I was debugging, trying to figure out why my custom CRD lister wasn't working and it was because of some uh, restrictions that I had codified myself <laughs> into the listers, um, you would understand <laughs> why I went with this approach. Um, and then, let's see, we talked about exposing shard dimensions to users when they're writing controllers, which looks fairly similar to scope. Do this we... is what Clayton was talking about. Okay, yeah, uh, we'll see. And then the will the key root also be able to handle virtual workspaces? Uh, the key root bit was just for, like there's one special case in etcd listing and watching where if you're doing a wildcard lister watch the key prefix that comp that's set doesn't include the logical cluster name and so when we get an item out or when we get a key from etcd and we strip off the key prefix what's left is the cluster name and then a slash and then the resource name and so to properly decode it and set the cluster name appropriately we've We've got to do special handling based on gotcha. if it's a wild card or not. So that that's what that's all for. And yeah, I mean, I, I think anything that's in etcd that we pull out that is using our prefix conventions will work with this, which would be everything. Cool. This seems to like have the uh, like clarity and direct intent that the current like dot cluster stuff has and is a more general approach so i like it yeah i'm i'm gonna see like once i finish finding all the places where we're using the uh with cluster cluster name from like the the older code once i rip all of those out and replace them with scopes then i'm gonna try and replace the cluster calls to the clients with a scope and see if um if this will work um, am I wrong um, saying that it also tackles the use case where you want to use an external library that is, you know, uh, using listers, but inherently single cluster? Uh, like my use case when I was trying to use the uh, project auth cache, you know, all the airbag stuff that comes from Cube as libraries, and they use listers as, as input. And of course, they try to use the listers without passing the cluster um, prefix uh, in the keys. And so this, this approach that you've taken also covers this. I mean, I can just pass to some cube library that is using listers, a scoped uh, lister, and then it would, uh, all, all the, the, the um, cluster prefixes in the case would be added automatically in fact yes. based on the scope list yeah yes. so the that's great the lister that you wrote that scopes it down uh, yeah. by hand you ideally and theoretically would be able to replace it with this yeah okay i'll try to do that as soon as you yeah it, <laughs> you tell so me okay. I, i've yeah. gone through so many iterations of trying to get this work and hack and like hacking stuff that yeah. uh, what I was telling Stefan yesterday is I'm, I'm going to get it working. I'll show it or, you know, uh, yeah. we can look at it, but then I'm going to start with a clean branch and manually <laughs> just copy stuff sure. over yeah. Yeah. as it makes sense. Um, yeah, that, that's very nice that, that we would be able to finally um, with what you did um, harmonize or yeah, all the yeah. use cases in a single. Uh, and I will reiterate that all of this work that I'm doing, which includes the 
the older prototyping is on top of my PR to bump us up to 123. So if anybody's interested in uh, looking at the rebase PR, it is up in the KCP dev Kubernetes fork as a pull request. Um, all right, so that's all I had for this. So thanks for your feedback, everybody. Uh, if you are interested in learning more and want to help out, um, please let me know. And just looking at the agenda, I don't see anything new. So um, we've we've got some time if anybody's got questions, comments, or wants to talk about anything, or we can end early. Going once, going twice. All right, sold. Uh, Y'all get 22 minutes back. So enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah.